Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to V with Mike G, the show of life, the show of chilies, poblanos, ancho chilies, chapulín, salt, pescatarianism, Miami, Mexico, mezcal, and more. Today's interview is with the amazing ambassador from Montalobos and Ancho Reyes, Miss Camille Austin. We talk about a lot of different things. We get to catch up during the San Antonio Cocktail Conference, and I get to sip through some of these amazing things that are, you know, they're commonplace in our cocktails. Everybody's tried Montalobos Mezcal, which is a lovely expression of Espadine, and many of us have been able to try the classic red version of the Ancho Reyes chili liquor, but I had the absolute privilege of trying the new Ancho Reyes Verde liquor, and I've got to tell you, as somebody who loves spicy foods... I put it on everything. I put it on eggs. I put hot sauce on my sandwiches. Anywhere I can possibly put it. The Ancho Reyes Verde, which launches this week in Texas, is a magical expression of the poblano chili. It is light, crisp, vegetal, spicy, and at 80 proof, it still packs a punch. And no, I'm not getting paid to say this. This just happens to be one of the finest liquors that really appeals to my palate that I have ever had the pleasure of tasting. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this chat with Camille Austin. No, it comes in moments. You're absolutely right. It really does come in moments. And and you forget. I, uh, you know, recently went to Tulum and I was able to kind of disconnect and just be there surrounded by nature and jungle and yeah. lots of mezcal away, away from <laughs> this we're like in the epicenter yes. of yes San Antonio. absolutely and i really do think you know like i told you before it's um it's it's where i live and you know in a place like new york you have it you know the constant constant hecticness of everything surrounding you but yeah. um but it is in moments it's not a constant you know then you go to the jungle and you're like oh Life is good. That's a pretty nice balance if you think about it. The hustle it is. and bustle. It is. I'm very lucky. Traveling around Definitely. like that. And it makes me wonder because, I mean, you've got to, there's these interesting chapters to your story as I've kind of read and we'll talk about it. But so let's let's say one thing that, and I think this is something Steve Olson always says, is that you don't find mezcal, mezcal finds you. It does. And luckily and literally, mezcal has found me on the table. So yes. we have, <laughs> because I think that it's the great facilitator. I'm going to sip so good to some me. Montalobos. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't, well, you can't have it that close to me and not make me want to really like imbibe in it. But I know, right? So we've got the, the standard Montalobos, which is 80 proof, right? And you've got some chocolate, some tomato with chipoline salt? Or chapuline salt? It's not chapuline. Mm. These are actually both... Um, Vegetarian salts oh, that great. Uh, we worked with a lady in Tlacolula in a town in Oaxaca. Mm. And she's a maestra salera, which basically means she's a salt master. Oh my so gosh. she definitely does, you know, she's made a business out of it um, at this point in time. But this is something that she kind of just learned how to do a from salt her mom. Master? Mm-hmm. She you... makes these all by hand and she, she gathers the spices and the herbs and the chilies and everything to make them, and she sells them to local markets. That's incredible. And, of course, to us now. That's amazing. So for you, what kind of salt person are you? Are you an herby salt person, a minerally salt person, chili salt person? That's a great question. I I would definitely say that I'm an herby yeah. uh, salt person. I also like the, the minerality of it. Um, she grinds these all on a molcajete, so... You could definitely say that some minerality comes in, in that part of the process. Yeah. But uh, I, I love that grassiness, that herbaceousness. And, and that's also recent in my palate because, you know, our palates change I think as that, we go along. That's why kids don't drink chartreuse, I think. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, you, you kind of grow into it. Now chartreuse is a little bit strong for me, but that does have that pastoral kind of thing that you can only really kind of understand when you get older. Like yeah, a Madre Cliche kind of thing. Yeah, it could yeah. be. So, I don't know. Absolutely. Well, these are amazing salts. So I've got to sip some Montalobos. But we talk about the vegetarian thing, which I think is interesting. And that's, yes. that's something that was unstated, but hence why you're using totally vegetarian salts. 
and uh, didn't bring like Hamon or <laughs> chorizo or something <laughs> to taste with the mezcal. But how long has that been? Going well, I'm through? actually a pescatarian, oh, okay. so I do eat uh, fish and seafood, but I've I've uh, not eaten meat for I would say almost maybe eight or nine years That's now. Really so wild. it's far before I uh, really got you know deep into mezcal, but. My rule is I have to try everything once. Good. Okay. I like and, that. Um, and I'm always guys, intrigued by it. Oh, absolutely. It's I, I always. Some pro- okay. Sorry. I always have to try a pachuga, and you know I have a funny story about. Um, I actually spent my last birthday in Oaxaca. Okay. Beautiful. And I walked into a mezcal uh, mezcaleria, and there was a really well-known uh, mezcal producer there who offered me some of his best pachuga. And absolutely, I was not going to what? turn oh. that down. Yeah, that's kind of... I actually loved every drop of it. That's you know, amazing. I just kind of left aside the fact that it was a pachuga and um, I enjoyed it. And but it was a great birthday celebration. That's the admirable thing about allowing yourself to experience the world. Because the problem I have is not fundamentally with vegetarianism or even really a problem with it. But if you're going to someone's backyard in which they're sharing their life, absolutely, they're giving them a a little, you know, you a little piece of them. Um, And I think it's very important to keep an open mind and and receive that. I think so too. Because in receiving, you shall get back as well. See, so that kind of ties it back. So maybe there is still hope, despite how we might feel about things going on in DC but so from my what I understand I have this western probably tilted perspective of Cancun but that is where yes. you were born and raised yeah I grew up in Cancun I moved back to the states until um, I was about 20 years old and my mother's American oh, okay I get that that a lot you know oh well you speak English really well right. I'm just <laughs> thinking well it was all kind of rolled into one language for me. You yeah. know, I spoke English and Spanish since I was a little baby. So your father is? My father is originally from Mexico City. Oh, okay. And uh, his name is Carlos Santiago Austin Ramos. That is and a I got pretty the legendary. It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a legendary sounding name. So uh, he, my dad's an oceanographer, and he's one of the pioneers of Cancun. Cancun's a very young city, mm-hmm. and um, I'm 31. Mm-hmm. When my generation is you know, one of the first kind of generations of kids being from Cancun. So um, I grew up in tourism and hospitality, and my dad owns a marina and, you know, with the ocean and going to the beach, and I was a competitive swimmer. So a very aquatic, very kind of natural, beautiful uh, way of growing up. How did you feel about, because from what I understand from Cancun, I haven't yet to be there, but very tourist-driven. Very much so. Is that a cool thing as someone that lives there that that you're kind of having to deal with these guys coming in all the time women and guys yeah. well it is a cool thing and i i think um at a very early age it allowed me to be very comfortable with people from all around the world yeah. around me and be very comfortable with cultures and be very curious at the same time and i also feel like later down the road when my career fell into hospitality Um, I had an innate kind of understanding of having an open mind and receiving, you know, cultures, genders, uh, any people of any different situation. It was in your DNA. It was in my DNA for sure. What did your mom do? So my mom was an equestrian teacher. So C... You basically have surf and turf. Correct. <laughs> surf and turf. <laughs> you really do. I have surf and turf. That is correct. <laughs> That is correct. Would it, so where so you said your mom was American. Where was she from? Yes. So she's from Dallas. Dallas. She's okay. from Texas. It all ties back. So yes, it all ties back to Texas. Texas. <laughs> you can never get away from it. No and we're here in San try. Antonio, so that's that's kind of cool. Almost full circle. San Antonio is a little bit better than a little Almost. bit cooler, I think, than Dallas. So uh, you said you came into the states when you were twenty. Is that right? I came in when I was 20 um, and I moved to Miami. It's Miami's a place that I had, you know, been visiting that, so frequently. Why were you visiting Miami? Because my dad had a house there and, oh, okay. you know, he would come back and forth and get parts for the marina or parts for the boats or something like that. So this is somewhere where we would go to, you know, just hang out and vacation with yeah. our dad several times a year. I was very familiar. It was very Latin. Uh, it was also a beach town or city. 
Um, very, very similar kind of culture to Cancun. But the reason that I moved away in that moment was because we had a terrible hurricane mm. called Wilma in 2006. Um, and Cancun kind of really stalled for a year. You know, right. they had to rebuild the city. So, of course, every story um, is, it a boy? Know, is a boy. Uh, it is a boy. <laughs> That's okay. I'm unapologetic about moving to, to, to yeah. Austin. So I, I felt like a hot shot that I was, I was a big girl now. And I'm like, peace out, Dad. I'm going to move to Miami with my boyfriend <gasps> and... Uh, Eat some ceviche you know. and drink daiquiris. I don't know. I don't know what they do in Miami. Exactly. You have to tell me, but. Well, you know, uh, speak a lot of Spanish. You know, you definitely have ceviche. Yeah, on the beach. I heard that's a thing. <laughs> Drive flashy fresh, cars. Right? Oh yeah. Well, so did you at that point? Because it's shortly after high school, and were you pursuing the academic side of things as well? Because oceanography seems pretty erudite. Like you got to get a degree for that, right? Yeah, I, I was never, that was never my passion. It was always kind of my dad's career mm -hmm. and um, something that I grew up with. But I, I really wanted to do something where I could connect with people. Yeah. Um, I was, earlier I had been really interested in performing arts. And then kind of as I started growing older, I uh, actually started a job in hospitality in a restaurant before I moved away from Cancun a couple years before. Okay. So I was already working in restaurants. When you say performing arts, which aspect of that do you mean? A little bit of everything. Theater, singing, dancing. I love to do all of that stuff. Um, but then when I think the, the reality of, you know, having stability and having a job hit me <laughs> when I <laughs> left my dad's house and moved to Miami. Are there VHS tapes around? of you singing and dancing on stage there might be a few i thought th there had to be there <laughs> i is won't tell you us. where they are though well that's the, that's therein lies the fun <laughs> that's where the briary piece comes in later in life but moving because of romance which makes some sense you know you've got you it, it feels like the the portfolio and this kind of collection of characteristics in your personality makes perfect sense you'd end up in hospitality did you how did the boy thing work out I don't well, know if that's a trick question. Or not. So it's not really a trick question. You know, we pretty much broke up about four months after moving to Miami together, yeah. but we're still very, very dear friends today. Um, and he, I, I actually just recently saw him in Chicago at a mezcal event because he's, no he's recently really getting into mezcal. He's also stayed in hospitality, you know, in management and ownership. Um, and with the mezcal category on the rise, yeah. you know, it's... Good time. Everybody's into it, so. For sure. So it seems like you start to get some accolades and acclaim in Miami. But going back just a little bit, so when you, we talk about alcohol, because it is a centerpiece to your life, not because you're drunk, but because creatively and the, the cultural aspects of Ancho Reyes and Montalobos, what was alcohol like when you were younger? Was everybody, your dad was cool with it as long as it's regulated? Was it a big staple? Yeah, I mean, I... I never really, you know, went out and got too crazy. It was always kind of something that I saw as work because when I moved to Miami, I had already experienced working in restaurants, and um, and so I got a job at a restaurant at the time, and I was a server. Mm. And then I saw these girls behind the bar, and I was like, oh, my God, I really want to do what you're doing right now. That looks so cool. What, like, the which piece of it? The... Were Everything. They dressed, like I mean, all of it, the shaking, the visceral kind of. Absolutely. You know, the cool cocktails that they were making, but also the fact of that they had this adrenaline that they were able to connect with so many people. And that's yeah. a big part of who I am. Performer, I love right? people. I love, yeah, I love, I mean, yes, perform, performing, Not but in a more bad way. so. Not in a bad no, for sure. But, but more so um, connecting with people from all over in all walks yeah. of life. And the fact that, you know, I had a table that I would be taken care of for three hours of a family or mm. somebody that didn't want to be interrupted to uh, go to a bar and be behind it and have, you know, 30 people at the same time that yeah. I could be chatting The different chatting paces with. of life. The different it's pace. It so just cool. seems so exciting and glamorous. So I convinced my manager to let me come in on my days off and let me train behind the, head, the bar with the head bartender. What year uh, are we talking yes. roughly, like when you kind of stepped behind the bar? This was... Um, this was about 
probably eight months after I moved to Miami. So okay. it must have been about 11 years ago. Wow. It's a yeah. completely different time. Completely different. There it was, were, it was, was a mojito, a flavored mojito bar. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Still has its merits. You can I mean, kind of picture that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can't remember. I, I can't imagine you ever wearing pants. Like that's do people wear pants in Miami? It seems like shorts all the time. Well, the the girl bartenders, we were definitely dressed kind of as go go dancers. You know, it was oh, yeah. on Miami on Lincoln Road. Of course. Um, it was a lot of fun though. I had a blast. Was there a gig kind of as you move forward and get interest? Because it, you think about it, like you're interested in people, different kinds of personalities, different kinds of cultures. What's a better vehicle for representing that culture than alcohol? Typically, right from Absolutely. all around the world. Was there a spirit or a cocktail that you kind of tasted and maybe it expanded your mind a bit about spirits itself? I can't remember a very particular cocktail, but I do remember an instance when, uh, you know, about maybe three years after that, I got a job at a restaurant bar that was going to open in Miami inside a hotel, a very kind of famous hotel. Mm. And it was this Michelin starred Chinese restaurant from London oh, wow. and I didn't know anything about it and we went through this crazy rigorous training on craft cocktails mm. and at that time you know craft cocktails was not a thing in Miami yeah. and it just completely opened my mind to a whole nother world and I thought oh my goodness fresh ingredients you know you were making cocktails like you would prepare them maybe in a kitchen. Yeah, or like this a, is insane. Yeah, like a salad. We all know salads. But we never think of cocktails that way. Definitely. And so, it kind of opens your mind to that concept. And how long do you? How long was it before you you felt like you were really, really a piece, a core piece of the cocktail scene in Miami? Well, I ended up working for that company for a total of five and a half years. Oh wow! And uh, through them, I was able to, you know accomplish one of my dreams that was to move to New York City before I was 30 years Amazing. old. Amazing. And I was there in Miami with them for three years. I became, a, you know, I moved up in the ranks, became the head bartender, became kind of that person who would create all the cocktail lists. And I loved doing that because I really think as we grow and through our experiences, we get to know ourselves a lot better. And sure. I, I was releasing a, a creative energy that I had. Um, and channeling that and I had found a passion that's a great point yeah because so for us that are performers or at once one point performed booze and that's not that's a great I think that's the greatest word for it it's it does enlighten us it does kind of uh, keep us creative it you know does. so we don't feel like we're ever getting away from the art too too much it really does and I think that you know we we drink when we're happy and we drink when we're sad. So Best business ever, um, right? I just, I, I really fell uh, into a comfort zone about being somebody's psychologist, yeah. if you will. You know, having my regulars come back to the bar and see me and be so enamored with, you know, the cocktail for as simple as it may be that I made him. And I made it with so much love. And then for me to be able to listen to their stories yeah. and talk to them about life, I just, I loved that. Are you a nurturing kind of person? Are you the one that likes to take care I of am. other people? Yeah. I am for sure. Um, some, you know, something very much about my character is that I love to give back. And I will, for those who I, I love and care about, I will, you do know, anything. I'll do anything for them. That's amazing. And I think it's a great great characteristic person, trait to have when you're taking care of other people even though i'm sure they're very trying at times yes. especially when they drink so yes. <laughs> <laughs> without a doubt so the pace of business the pace of life between miami and new york both probably pretty pretty fast paced but it's different and how what was it like a very disjointed and jarring difference moving from miami to new york it was, and there's a saying about moving to New York that you really need at least, you know, more than a year to get settled, and that will be the the tell-all whether you have made it or not, you mm. know, whether you're a New Yorker to stay or whether you're going to go back to where you came from. 
and the first year, and I would say the first two years, and maybe even until the first three years were really hard for me. What, it, what aspect of it was most of it? Everything, you know, getting used to the pace of life in the city, and I loved it. Yeah. I'm definitely not a quitter, so I was not ready. I had told everybody very naively, you know, my, my close people around me, oh, I'm just going to go up there for a year and experience it, and I'll be back in Miami, Miami's home. Right. My sister still lives in Miami, okay. so I definitely feel... Did she feel come with you, too, when you moved uh, around 20? She, she came uh, slightly after okay. because she was actually coming uh, after the hurricane to go to an exercise science school in Miami. So Interesting, okay. So that was really kind of, you know, great to have my support system there. Absolutely. Um, we're very close in age, and we're very close, period, even though we're worlds apart but in I personality like the but we're, and the yang of it. i i you know could not imagine talking to my sister every week uh, not talking to my sister <laughs> okay. every week sorry i pictured it both ways <laughs> that's like, what i, I wonder if she's really really <laughs> annoying or just no really she lovable. does definitely drive me crazy sometimes but i think that's what sisters or or siblings are for in the best of ways absolutely so at that year mark because you're telling yourself, uh, maybe you know, it's just a stint. I'm gonna do this thing for a little while. I'm gonna kind of come back. Yeah, to I was like, I can't move back now. I haven't done anything here. I'm in credit card debt. I'm, you know, like not even uh, settled here. I'm moving apartments again. Yeah. Um, anybody who lives in New York City knows that that's kind of New York. But that's, it's, it's the the annoyance about it. It's it's also the charm, and the transient lifestyle in a sense, right? It, it can be, but um, on the other hand, it's a melting pot of the world. Yeah. And I think that that's what has just kept me there, like a magnet, being surrounded by every walk of life and, you know, having everything at your fingertips and it being the challenge because I'm a person that needs to be challenged. Yeah. So, um, Are you competitive? I am a little <laughs> bit competitive, can you tell? Well, I just... In I, a good way, in a I healthy way. I think so, way. too. Like... I talk to plenty, plenty of people, and ultimately, I'm like, I wonder what we have in common, right? Because that's kind of a conversations are that way. You want to know what's different about two people, but you also want to know how can we connect. And I can sense it. I'm the same way. Like, once you put your mind to something, there's no stopping you, is there? Definitely not. No <laughs> stopping. So at that point, because th th this, I'm gonna have to bookmark this for a question here in just a bit. But it sounds like you want bigger opportunities. You want bigger responsibility. Ultimately, was the Soho House a continuation of the Miami company or was that a different gig? That was a different gig. Um, the Miami company was Hakkasan, also okay, a British okay. company. So it's very kind of globally known now. But at the point in time where I worked with them, it was a very high-end kind of crafty restaurant group. Yeah. Now they've got nightclubs and, and other stuff. But um, it was it was a really amazing experience and kind of, gave me a gateway into the cocktail world and gave me so such a great platform yeah. to meet a lot of great people and to learn. Um, and then I got contacted by Soho House to come over and work for them uh, as the bar manager in New York. And that gave me a completely different experience because the New York house, there's no stopping it. I mean, that was just you know, hundreds of people a day, yeah. all members, so all spent so much time at the house. And we had four bars open in high season, all simultaneously at once. It was about 22 bartenders to oversee, and everybody had different schedules. And it just, it really, um, you know, it gave me such a great experience um, of multitasking mm. and just kind of overseeing the needs of so many people. Did it push you a little bit harder than? Oh, you it totally you? pushed me. It was adrenaline. I mean, when we were in the thick of the summer, yeah. and that rooftop was open, in a city where you know most of the months are cold and gloomy, cold. and everybody wants those three months of getting a tan, uh, <laughs> it is cutthroat, Whereas and it was so exciting. In Miami, right? Like it's the inverse. It was just so cool, you know. It 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 was exhausting. I worked really long hours and, and long days, but. I met so many cool people. I got to see some amazing private music events, you uh -huh. know, really intimate. I got to see John Legend and, uh, you know, Spencer Ludwig and, and all of these kind of musicians play in intimate concerts. Amazing, and yeah. I got to meet Sam Smith and chat with him oh, yeah. and Rihanna. And 
so, so I was so I was nice. like, oh my gosh, this place is so cool. So like, despite what is kind of like these mild perks of this, there's always nice meat. There is this intersection, a very distinct one between celebrities and booze. There really is. And I love that because every once in a while you'll run into this people like, oh, you're the blah, blah, blah. You're drinking that. Oh, I know. You know, anyway. But did you wrestle? Was it ever so overwhelming or so overburdening that you thought about walking away from the industry? Definitely. It takes a lot physically out of you. Um, and, you know, we, we did cocktails there as much as we could. Yeah. But it was so high volume and so demanding that any of the cocktails that we, we made you know, they had to be very easily ex- executed. Yeah, and you got to go through You have them, to get right? them out. You have to get them out. And you can't have a long list of 35 cocktails, you know, with intricate, hard to source, expensive ingredients like I was used to at Hakkasan. Yeah. Um, but the reason that I left was actually because I got poached by the Wait founders of Montalobos. <laughs> so, okay. This is, I mean, and you've done an amazing job of transitioning into this next chapter maybe we'll reverse it you ask me a couple questions but i get it i get it mezcal makes sense right so you've got time in mexico you were raised there you've got the multicultural dna just thinking about things in a different way and wanting to connect with nature like so all this stuff obviously this is the perfect intro for mezcal as a category but so what it what was that conversation like what what did they see in you that they thought okay camille this personality this person is going to be a great representation of Mezcal and Montalobos. Well, it's really interesting because they actually approached me for the first time when I was ending my tenure at Hakkasan. Mm-hmm. So this was a little over a year before um, I act, maybe about a, a year and a half actually before I actually started with them. Um, and then after that, I still went to Soho House because I was not sure that I wanted to do this yet. I wasn't sure that I wanted to break away from the bar, and I yeah. wasn't sure that I wanted to become an ambassador. Um, I had tons of ambassador friends, and specifically some very close to me that worked in tequila. And, you know, they, they broke down the lifestyle a little bit for me, and, and it sounded like a bunch of cons um, <laughs> at that time, yeah. because I was, I, I think, just... The reality of, of it was I was scared. I was scared of leaving my team and my home base and, mm. and my bar program. But that's not going to keep you down. Sorry, I was swallowing that mess. I have to savor that a bit. But th- I think we both know by now that it's like, well, all right, you don't think, if, I guess you're not good enough to do it, Camille. I guess you can't take on this big chapter, this big challenge. No, and it really helped that the... Well, we affectionately, we affectionately call our, our Mexico City team the Mexicans, <laughs> uh, just to kind of differentiate that with William Grant. Yeah. And um, the Mexicans, it was specifically <laughs> Danny and Moy and uh, two of our found- well, two of the founders of Milagro, whom I had a relationship with since Miami. Oh, wow. Because we, you know, carried Milagro and we always had it on our menu. And I was part of one of the first bartender trade trips to the Milagro Distillery in 2011. Amazing. That was a fantastic experience, and I became very good friends, um, consequently, with Jaime Salas and Gaston Martinez, Mm -hmm. who Gaston is no longer with the brand, but he was the West Coast ambassador at the time. And, you know, they've stayed my friends up until this day. So um, Danny specifically really pressed. And I also think that the first time that they approached me when I was still at Hakkasan, yeah. They really didn't know, and the brand wasn't at the moment where they were ready to ask somebody, you know, to be their ambassador because they really didn't know what that entailed. Got it. So they don't it know. It was what a the very different moment in really, Mezcal right? in the U.S. Yeah. Absolutely, they they didn't know. Uh, you know, I mean, there were very few brands here. They didn't know about how the category was going to be received, and many people didn't know what Mezcal was right. at that point. Still don't. Still don't, Still up, but we've made yeah. leaps and bounds. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you. And, uh, and of course, Montalobos was not the first mezcal I had. Right. Um, the first sip of mezcal I had came from a, a dear friend of mine, Stephen Myers, when oh, he yeah. was launching a tiny little brand at the time called Illegal. Illegal, that's right, yeah. So, yeah. T- I mean, did, how did, when did you find out that mezcal was right for you? 
when when did you kind of understand that it was that was the right match? It maybe doesn't matter about the brand as much because mezcal is much larger. It's more cerebral. It's more cultural than that. Well, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't think so much at the time specifically that it was mezcal. Um, I knew I I had a good foundation of mezcal, but I had no nowhere near the knowledge and you know the spiritual understanding yeah. that I do now from spiritual understanding. That's, that's and good. that's that's the real key because mezcal and we'll, we'll we can talk about that a little bit later. But you know, just like you said, that Steve Olson said, mezcal finds you. Yeah. It really does in the sense that you have to you have to go there. You have to go to mezcal land, and you have to be surrounded by it to understand that it's heritage and it's culture. It changes you. It definitely changes you. And I think the number one thing about me have, having been in the States for so long at that time, um, or, well, I mean, not so long, but for a few years, um, I, I missed home and I missed a part of me because mm. I am bicultural. You know, I am half Mexican and half American and my soul is so Mexican and... I think that's, <laughs> I know, as, as cheesy as that sounds, but... Um, I hope, like, you're not just every day in and out, like, no. inter-conflicted, yeah. No, not at all. I, it's definitely an, an on and off switch, you know, when that's, you're in the place. That's a great thing. And then you have a duality. I love this word lately, but... A total duality, and I think it was... It, it, the bigger picture was about working with a team and working with a product mm. um, that I thought was going to to connect me or reconnect me with myself and my, my background. That, that's really lovely because it's familial in a way, right? Because it really what it's doing is taking you back to those times you had living in Mexico, which was really time you spent with your family. So that is a lovely, lo- lovely sentiment about Mezcal. And so when did you officially kind of, you made everything work mentally, you realized it was the next step to take. When did you start with Montalobos? I started with them about a year and two months after they first approached me. Wow. Um, at this point, I mean, I had worked a full year circle at Soho House, <laughs> went through that crazy summer, and I met so many great people, and I loved it. But I, feel, I, I just think that I was completely burned out. Yeah. Um, and I was in a different headspace. I, you know, was kind of ready to, to go back into the high season, uh, but I had a long conversation with my friend Jaime, who works for Milagro. And, you know, he said, you are such a person. He knows me really well yeah. and maybe a little bit better <laughs> sometimes than I know, know myself. Yeah. And I think that's something to be said about, you know, your close friends and family. Um, but he he told me, you are such a person that, you know, will love working with people and you'll still get to channel your creativity through creating cocktails for the brand and, mm. and creating a, a brand feel. Um, and, you know, this is a really fun job. You get to experience incredible things on a regular basis that, you know, otherwise any normal person doesn't have access to. Yeah. It, is, it is trying and it's exhausting. And you have to be a person that will, will uh, respect, you know, your time and your balance, and you have to make it an effort to sleep and eat right, and no excess on it's the drinking. It's kind of on you, right? It's kind of on you. It's the total self-management, and, right? and I think I was afraid of myself. Really? <laughs> I think that's why I took so long to accept uh, the the opportunity. Maybe that you can go to those dark, unabashed places, like because sometimes if you don't have to be structured, you're not going to be structured. I don't know how organized you are. I seem relatively organized. I am. I'm, I'm really organized. And you know what? Being a, a bar manager for uh, the establishments that I was for the last four years really helped me lay down a really strong foundation for skills yeah. that I use right now, um, you know, that really help me out for events and, and so on. That's amazing. Yeah. So how long now have you been with Montalobos? I've been with Montalobos. I'm going on my third and a half year. That's brilliant. And you know what? There's no looking back. I'm, I'm really proud of my history. And we have such an incredible team that I, I could not be more thankful for. I mean, I work with some crazy and visionary um, 
I mean, just incredible people. Like innovative, you know, right? So innovative. So innovative. And specifically, our founder, Yvonne, has become a very, very close friend of mine and a mentor. Um, he's very tall, I hear. He's very tall. He's <laughs> one of the tallest Mexicans you'll ever meet. I wasn't going to say it. But it's true. Hey, we can say it. We it's can like say six, it. He's like 6'5 or something. He is. I don't know why. I've got this preoccupation with him. He's, I don't know he's why. very, very tall. And he wears these, you know, thick glasses. Yeah. And he speaks with a really Isn't deep, very voice, deep voice. Kind of yeah. like this. He's 100% intimidating. And then when you get to know him, Zero oh my <laughs> goodness, he's got a squishy little heart. It's amazing. He is the best. So in this three plus years that you've been kind of thrown into the world of Mescal and sharing Montalobos all around the world, I imagine, what is there any big takeaways so far? Like you've spent some great time with some great people. You've met a lot of people. Is there anything that you've can say now kind of without a doubt about mezcal that maybe you didn't ever think about before yeah i think it's i think it's exactly that i don't think that this is like any other spirit um you know there's there's i mean not to put anything down but this is this is a complete culture this is uh something that you don't really understand again Mm -hmm. until you live it until you're surrounded by those people who have either been producing this or drinking this or, you know, trading this for their entire life, and this is what they know how to do. They live off the land, um, and, you know, and they trade it and they celebrate with it, and it's just, it's something like no other. You know uh, Polaroids? Remember the... Yes. They still make them kind of, and you shake it like a Polaroid picture. So it's a snapshot of a place and time with a particular subject. Never can be replicated can't be edited, can't be altered. That is what mezcal is to me. It really is. The perfect is. imprint of a time and place. And I, the Montalobos, and this, I'm going to be honest, this is the first time I've, I've seen it plenty, but this is the first time I've had it, and it's really I can't lovely. believe that. What's wrong with me? No, Why haven't I come to see you before? Well, <laughs> Shame on I, I promise you, this will not <laughs> be the, the last you. time. I know, I know. <laughs> but it's, you maintain a lot of complexity for something at 80 proof. Yes. You don't feel like it's, a bunch of water. Well, it's ultimately. actually not 80 proof. Oh, it's, sorry if I'm... It's 43.2. Oh, even better. Okay. So yeah. It, yeah. But um, but you're 100% right. It is very complex, and it's also all about balance, and yeah. that's really something that I think um, was, you know, one of the key visions in Yvonne's, um, you know, trajectory that he wanted to... He's a biologist, mm-hmm. and he, he wanted to make something that was sustainable, it was organic, and... You know, we were only going to produce as much as we could. Um, and, of course, we are only now recently in the last, like, year and a half selling enough. But the first well, couple of years, happens, yeah, yeah, absolutely, because sure. nobody really knew about mezcal. But my point is, you know, we worked up a little bit of inventory. And um, and it's just this delicious mezcal that is maybe not a historic taste, but it's so balanced and so sessionable. You get smoke and you get green agave you get Mm. that herbaceousness those botanicals and you get the caramels and you get the funkiness from the fermentation you get you know a little bit of uh ripe fruits and you get so many flavors it really is and at 43 so this is the thing i think that's a really wise move sometimes and some of the greatest mezcals i've had at 55 percent alcohol you can't tell but this at 43 is so warm and it, uh, rather comforting yes, and inviting. It's very you know? sessionable. And I really like the subtle sweetness and the subtle spice of it too. There's just this perfect blend and I'm, I'm very pleased. I really appreciate you sharing that with of me. Of course. Of course, mezcal, you talk about parallel parallels to mezcal. You eat wonderful food in Oaxaca, but you also enjoy wonderfully spicy Foods, the moles, yes. the ancho powder, the other kind. You know, there's so many different things with peppers. So that kind of brings us to the final, kind of the next chapter with Ancho Reyes. And that's also a project of Yvonne's? Yes, it's a project of ours. Um, we are very lucky, of course, to have a relationship with William Grant and Sons, who's yeah. our U.S. importer. Um, and Danny and Moy, you know, formed this relationship years ago with tequila milagro that they launched um and then william grant later acquired but um you know there are partners and in mexico city we have this very small company called casa lumbre mm-hmm. um lumbre which is a type lumbre, of agave, right? 
lumbre, which is actually, it means light and okay. fire. It means fire. So it's, you know, uh, basically to give you that feel of handcrafted, you know, the house of very handcrafted Mexican kind of flavors and spirits. Okay. So um, Ancho Reyes falls under us and... Yvonne is the gentleman behind it, along with somebody that we can't ever forget when we're talking about Ancho Reyes, and that's Lupita. She's our master blender. Oh, amazing. She's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, she has a better palate than Yvonne. Ah, <laughs> and I bet she's shorter than him. If she was no, taller, she's that fantastic. would be incredible. She's, uh, you know, Yvonne took her under his wing for many years, and um, she's just blossomed into this super talented um and she's the one that kind of oversees the production. Amazing. And makes sure that Ancho Reyes is also always consistent because, you know, when you're working with chilies, oh, it's you so never good. know what you're going to so get. So hot, so not Absolutely. hot, small sizes, all of that. All the time. And so if I understand correctly, and correct, this is a sugar base? Is that right? It's a neutral cane spirit Cane base. spirit, yeah. It's a neutral cane spirit. But if you look at the package of Ancho Reyes, it has this very apothecary feel. Yeah. Um, and, and the whole recipe was inspired on this 1920s, you know, family story. Mm -hmm. It was the Reyes family, so that's why we kind of lent it the name. Um, and Moy was the one that heard about this story, and he, you know, spent months doing lots of um, investigation and went to Puebla and was looking for a recipe. And he never found a recipe, but he found so much about that time period right. and we learned that back then in the 20s what you could get was you know Veracruz produced a lot of sugar cane so they were able to get this cane spirit and we really wanted it to be all about the chilies so we felt it a very appropriate and fitting uh, you base keep something really neutral much like we talk about gin you want those botanicals you want that chili to just come to the top right for sure and and i think the kind of all with this is there there you know at the time that we launched it um in late 2013 mm -hmm. with our partners the bon vivants here in the states um there was really not anything like it on the market you know that was all about the chili mm -hmm. it, this is like a quintessential like really true mexican flavor it is. it's not a spiced agave or you know, a gin or this anything. This is earthy. This, this is, is earthy pepper. Earthy, you know? and it's baking spices, and it's tamarind, and it's, you know, delicious. It's a, I, I love it, which which I can't go any longer without sipping the original Ancho Reyes here. Let me grab this. That's the, here, take this guy. Oh, that's the. And there's two main differences. Um, of course. And this is the original inception, you said, shortly uh, around 2013, you guys released it, the original, how do you classify it now or distinguish it from the We Verde? call it the original. The original. Yep. Okay. We call it Ancho Reyes original and Ancho Verde. Which took the world by storm. It I took think that is the world by storm. <laughs> I think we were all kind of seeking something that was hot and spicy and earthy. I put this powder on my eggs every morning. You Good. know? So it's like I can smell it. I'm like, oh, that's breakfast for me. <laughs> now I don't drink at breakfast. but. And, it, and, and, you know, talking a little bit about having a sense of place, I mean, this is Puebla, if mm. you ever asked for it, you know, um, if, if you've, I don't know if you've spent any, any time in Puebla, but mm. if you go during September, you know, you'll go to every restaurant and they'll want to serve you chiles and nogada. I mean, it's all about the poblano pepper. It's incredible. I hear you can smell it in the air too, like the rose. You really can. Chiles you really it. can. But I love that. That's a, again, a time and a place. Now you use this pepper. Oh gosh, it's just lovely. And I know that was received really well. And I know that people were leveraging in a lot of different ways. Adult milkshakes was a great execution. Spicy with cream and ice cream. I mean, think so about versatile. Yeah. I mean, it it goes so well. You know, just kind of as a boiler maker, a shot in a oh, beer yeah. type of thing. Um, we have a an account in in uh, San Francisco that put it on tap oh, really gosh. early on and would just serve it with a. Tecate, and you'd be done with it, and it, you know they'd call it an ancho ball. So oh, I like that. That's good. It was uh, it was just really, really embraced, and bartenders got really creative with it, and we never expected um, you know all the attention and all the organic kind of press that it received. Was it that kind of people getting creative with it, the discussion around it, and the momentum that the original overproduced it, but that that had that kind of led you guys to say, all right, all right. Let's maybe pursue, which is the unripened version of the Ancho, right? And then with the Ancho Reyes Verde. I mean, what was the impetus there? Yeah, you know, um, we have a, a 
a group of people, a team that is always thinking, mm-hmm. always constantly thinking for that next best thing. And they're all Mexican and they're all so proud to be Mexican and, and so proud of, of Mexican food and flavors and culture yeah. um, that they really want to always kind of innovate and share that with the world. And um, I, I would love to say that this was a natural progression. Right. Um, but, you know, there was some ideas thrown around here and there. But I think ultimately it was just that question of, well, we, we have, you know, a really well-received, embraced product. And we're working with these amazing farmers, and, and specifically one uh, in particular, Don Saul. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have this raw material that to be able to be dried, you know, it has to go through being green. So why don't, you know, we're Mexican. We use red <laughs> salsa. We use green salsa. These are the flavors of Mexico. Duality again. A hundred percent. And I Red really think that green. that was just kind of, you know, natural. We had to, we had to see if this would work. And I love will. that you're catching it in a different part of its life. It's like dating someone when they're not ready for it, you know, oh, yeah. but it's still so exciting. It's so visceral. Of course you break up after a while, but that's the thing. It's like, this is bound to catch a different place and time. So this is my first time trying the Andreas Verde. And I have been so excited because I love spicy stuff and I suspect that it's going to be slightly more peppery and slightly crisper and lighter. I don't know. Let's see. Let's dun, see. Dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. Well, there's two oh main. My, there's two main. I know you're getting all that Holy vegetalness. I can yeah. smell it from oh here. My gosh. Well, there's two main differences. Um, you know, with the original, we're working with a late harvested poblano pepper. Mm. So we're leaving them on the vine so that they soak up all the nutrients and all of those flavors from the earth. Mm. And then we're, we're picking them when they're very, almost starting to turn a little bit red. There's only one harvest season, um, and that's around August from October. So the harvest season for the verde, the poblano, is a little earlier than that. Um, and then when you know we we oh, lay sorry. these, <laughs> it's so it's so good. It's, it's good. It's kitchen. spicy. It yeah, is. it's so spicy. I love it's it. It's spicy right. and it's herbal. And um, but we sun dry those for 15 days, and then this is where you know they get that natural sweetness, and then those baking spices, yeah. the tamarind and the cinnamon and all of that. So those are the two main differences. The with proof the verde. and everything's the, the same. The proof right? and everything's the same. It's macerated. It is for six months. Neutral day. cane spirit. Yeah. And I love this because it's it's 80 proof. I mean, it's That's this is going to stand up as a split base, you know? It's Man. fantastic. And um, and here we're using really ripe green poblanos and we're fire roasting them. So you get, you get a little spice that. here right up there, right right on the nose when you when you sip it. And the punch back of palate, just that that just real brisk, crisp spiciness that doesn't linger it's just enticing very enough. crisp that's the greatest part because the alcohol will just wash it out yeah and that that is absolutely lovely i'm trying to think about someone who started out all right here we, this is sean penn this is sean penn's career right now <laughs> right, he starts out he's kind of like really rugged punching dudes getting drunk smoking cigarettes but then he gets a little bit more refined a little bit warmer softer and then gets all the awards like this is the duality of this pepper and it is so profoundly different from the green to the red. I mean, it's, this is a, a lovely, lovely product. Yeah, and, it is. And I, and I think that's why, that's why bartenders are so exciting, excited about it. Because, you know, here you, you have something that will work so amazingly with clear spirits. Like, take a Hendrix gin with that vegetal c- cucumber note and mm. just add some Mancho Verde in here. And call it a day. I mean, it's fantastic. Verde Gimlet. I'm telling you. Absolutely. Yeah, so throw some lime juice and some subtle sweetness. Really, really exceptional. But it's not in Texas yet, is it? I haven't seen it yet. Very soon. Okay. Very soon. So we are looking to officially be available in Texas by this March. Amazing. Um, so I have, hint, hint, a bunch of hot sauce in my bag oh for my you God, guys are you to try. Me? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah, all right. That sounds enticing. Put yes. It, I'll put it that way. Well, I mean, I can't. That just appeals to me right now in the perfect way. The weather is perfect outside during San Antonio Cocktail Conference 2017. It's unseasonably warm. But this is nice and crisp. This is really lovely. I want to explore it a little bit more. And it starts with Montalobos. I, I think that creates the heart, right? The 
kind of stability and then you expand out into Ancho Reyes, the original, and then the Verde. I can't wait till it hits Texas. But I've been thinking about this one thing, though, this whole time we've been chatting. And that's beyond the wonderful flavors. And thank you so much for sharing. But you're very driven. You're ambitious. You're intelligent. You're only 31. Not to say that any time soon, God forbid, right, that you'd walk away from these lovely brands. But what, what is, what's it look like in the future? Like, are you someone who wants to own a brand? Do you want to own your own bar? Because the world is never going to be enough. And you're going to keep reaching for that next pinnacle. Ugh, it's never enough. Isn't that the problem, man? But I think that's okay. <laughs> I, you know, it's not like... It's not like you're seeking all this money all the time. Yeah. I don't think you're in it for no, the fame. No, it's, it's, you know? it's definitely not about that. It's about um, it's about creating and it's about you know reward and yeah. and uh, giving back and and feeling. Um, and I don't know if I could own a brand because I've seen how difficult <laughs> it is to launch them. But you've done everything else that's been <laughs> difficult. You know? I am. Um, I think I'll I'll leave that much up to um, you know our partners and founders Um, they're amazing at it I would definitely love to own a bar one day Um, and this could be you know maybe a partnership with them Um, I think that we've definitely all formed kind of friendships for life at this point Um, and if you asked me where that would be I I couldn't tell you I I sometimes think of New York and maybe Tulum (laughs) who knows I think the personality and I think because you're charming, I think you understand that. And but the that's it's that again the duality between being a performer, being someone that's really really task focused and organized. I don't know. I'm excited though. I'm excited to see where you go. I'm excited to see what you achieve. Or there's thank you. Eventually, it'll be enough. Me too. I we'll wonder see. what it'll be. <laughs> we'll see. I love it. Neither one of us know. But really, really brilliant sipping with you, and uh, I hope you enjoy. The rest of the gala tonight and any other cool stuff you're doing this this next couple of days during yeah Rock well Rapids? we will be um at the opening night gala tonight mm-hmm. serving up some cocktails with montalobos and with ancho reyes and we'll have plenty of the ancho verde Amazing. so i guess i um want to just invite everybody to come out and if you haven't already try some of this delicious mm. new ancho verde that will be soon in texas I'll be serving some cocktails with my friend Whitney Hobbs. Um, and then we're doing a, a brunch on Sunday because oh, it's cool. not over till it's over. It's not over until it's over. <laughs> and we'll have a bunch of brunch cocktails. Um, I have to actually check no, and no see problem. on the, but it should be on the San Antonio Cocktail Week website. Because all I want to do is eat some eggs and drink the Verde. Yes, I agree. And just like one after the other. Maybe, maybe some I'm Verde cheladas, maybe. Oh my God. I think it would work really well. Well, it's been brilliant chatting. Thanks so much. Thank Camille. you. And uh, Thank we'll you see each other me. more this yes, week. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there we have it. The amazing Camille Austin. Thank you so much, Camille, for spending some time with me and sharing your wonderful spirits. The Montalobo Mezcal was a pleasant surprise of that Espadine at approximately 44% ABV. Also, the Ancho Reyes, you get the legendary classic version, but I have to tell you, I am so very excited about the Texas launch of Ancho Reyes Verde this week. Finally, I've been able to sip a secret bottle for some time now, and this expression of the poblano chili and all of its crispness, and with amazing sugar, neutral spirit base, you have this beautiful marriage of sweetness and crisp spice. So keep your eyes peeled for the new Ancho Reyes Verde on a shelf near you. And thanks everybody for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter how you're feeling about one of the most amazing live television moments last night via the Academy Awards, do you think Warren Beatty made the mistake on purpose? Do you think he just merely had a logistical error involving an envelope? Or if you're thinking, man, I really liked some of those horror TV shows from the 1980s, please keep dancing.